So for this third um, lecture, we're going to talk about virus replication, uh, the virus replication cycle in general, and some terminology that describes the types of virus infections. So in general, a virus replication cycle has six steps. So the first is attachment, and we're going to go through each of these individually. The second is called penetration or entry, so how the virus gets into the cell. The third is uncoding, and basically uncoding, the goal is getting the genome into the cell, so getting rid of the envelope, if that's part of the virus, getting rid of the capsid. Step four, biosynthesis. So this includes expressing viral proteins. And viral genome replication. So all the components that are necessary, oops, to make a new virus. Assembly, assembly is really cool because viruses spontaneously self-assemble. So once there is enough viral, um, maybe spikes, if it's an envelope virus, nucleocapsids or capsid proteins and gen genomes, the viruses will spontaneously self-assemble. What's really cool about this is if you have the right components, you can do this in a test tube. So outside of a cell, you can mix all the protein components and the genome component components, excuse me, and the virus will automatically self-assemble. Last stage, stage six, is release or exit. So as my computer has decided, let's look at these individually. Attachment is the first point of specificity. And remember we talked about in uh, lecture one, specificity is essential for the virus to get into the right type of cells. So it's the first step in determining tropism. So tropism is which cells the virus can infect. So this is specific interactions between the virus and a host cell receptor. Okay. So let's let's write this down. Attachment is virus plus host cell receptor. So this diagram is showing pretty simple. Viruses are expressing proteins on the outside. Host cell has a receptor. They interact just like you've learned in cell biology. And away we go. Viruses can have co-receptors, which means there's a main receptor and in addition, another receptor is required. So this is an example of HIV. HIV's primary receptor is the CD4. So without that, nothing happens. And then for CD4 positive um, T cells, excuse me, HIV needs this co-receptor, CCR5, um, and for I think it's the lymphotrophic T cells, it needs CXCR4. So it has two different co-receptors. If one of these is absent, the virus can't um, infect either. Something off to the side, a tangent that's really cool about HIV, is that some people have a natural mutation in the CCR5 receptor. It's called a Delta 32 mutation. And we think this came about um, during the, I think, 1800s when there was the plague. 
and maybe this receptor or lack of receptor um, helped these people become uh, kind of immune to the plague. These people have carried this receptor, this mutation, throughout their life and are actually HIV resistant. So they will not get an HIV infection because they don't have the co-receptor. If you've heard recently in the news about gene edited babies, so a scientist in um, China did some CRISPR gene editing, which um, has been condemned by the whole science community as not ethical. We agreed not to do that. Um, <coughs> what he did was made these children with a CCR5 mutation to hopefully prevent them from ever getting HIV. That's a whole nother story to talk about, um, but just to give you a little context. Some viruses have many or multiple receptors. So Japanese encephalitis virus can infect lots of different cells because it's outside of the virus can interact with multiple uh, different receptors. And some viruses have kind of common receptors. Um, influenza isn't a super great example, but Ebola, when we talk about Ebola later this semester, it has a very general receptor that is expressed on lots of cells, and so it can infect lots of cell types. All right, so that's the first step attachment. You gotta have a cell with the receptor or there's no infection. Second step is um, entry. I'm just trying to peek at my slides here. Okay, so lots of different ways a cell can enter. Right up here is showing a cell that's interacting with the receptor and it has membrane fusion which means the viral envelope, so this only happens with the enveloped virus, and the cell membrane, because they're both made of phospholipid bilayers, fuse together and release the capsid into the cytoplasm. Okay. And that will allow the next step, which is uncoating. Lots of viruses are actually taken in by some kind of endocytosis. So sometimes it's receptor-mediated endocytosis, sometimes with like Ebola, it's called macropenocytosis, but some kind of triggering of the cell to bring in the virus in an endosome. And remember, an endosome is this little vesicle. What, uh, if you remember from your cell biology, an endosome will then get a decrease in pH, so it will become acidic, and it may fuse to a lysosome for deg degradation. So this is how um, some cells can um, remove things from your system, like a macrophage can remove a bacterial pathogen and digest it. What's really cool about viruses is they basically trick the cell into bringing it inside. And then when the drop in pH happens, which is natural for an endosome, it actually allows the virus to release the capsid or the genetic material. So remember, as we learn about viruses, viruses take all that you learned in cell biology and use it to their advantage. Um, oops, I'm gonna start my pen. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, the acidic part, which is uncoating. Um, a final way that a virus can um, attach and enter 
is some viruses will actually inject their genomic information, their genome, genome. Okay, so we saw this when we talked about bacteriophage and the Hershey Chase experiment. Um, actually, poliovirus can do this, and they can form this pore between the viral capsid and the host cell membrane and directly inject the genome. So they're kind of skipping the entry and going straight into um, uncoding. So let's look at that next step, uncoding. Oh no, let's look at plant viruses. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the reason I put plant viruses separate is because plant viruses do not use cellular receptors. Remember, a plant cell has a cell wall. And, hold on, sorry, my daughter's texting me. It doesn't matter where I am. In my office, in home, constant interruptions. Okay, so plant viruses do not use cellular receptors. Plant viruses get into the cell by mechanical means. Which means that um, either this is showing a little aphid, a bug that feeds off of um, the phloem of or the liquid parts of a plant, they can have a virus, all these little black dots in their salivary glands, and as they're sucking up liquid and spitting things out, they can um, release virus. You can also get plant viruses moved by insects chewing, so breaking through that cell wall. You can actually just mechanically rub so what this is showing, this is a um, pestle that has plant virus from sap, like we talked about with tobacco mosaic virus. And if you just rub it on the plant leaf, it will break cell walls enough to let the virus inside. And then the virus moves through the plant through the plasmodesmata. So if you ever took general biology with me, you know that's my favorite word in the world. Plasmodesmata which are like gap junctions in plant cells. And so the virus can move from cell to cell to cell, and then the virus actually gets in the phloem, which is the food of the plant, and can move through the vascular system of the plant. So cool. Um, farming, farming machinery, people picking crops, all of that mechanical disruption, you rub against a leaf, you can pick up virus from one plant and transfer it to another. So, though we're not going to talk about plant viruses this semester, plant viruses are a huge agricultural issue. Um, and that's what I was working on when I was a researcher at UCD. All right, step two is uncoding. So again, the goal of un uncoding is to get the genome out of the capsid. So again, like I showed you up here, sometimes this happens with entry. Um, most of the time, it's a second step. Um, this is showing an endosome. And when you have a decrease in the pH, it allows the virus proteins and genome to enter the cytoplasm. So the main idea is somehow you get the genetic material out of the um, virus and into the cell. Okay, so we've done attachment, penetration, entry, uncoding. Okay, so biosynthesis 
is something that we're going to talk specifically about for each different um, virus. And this is the way you go from genome to protein and genome to more genome. And this can get a little complex, so instead of giving you everything, we will wait until we hit those different viruses. Again, this is something I want you to think about um, as you do your presentation or you prepare your presentation because the biosynthesis part can be pretty interesting, um, the strategies that different viruses have. Step five is assembly, which is basically encapsidating the viral genome. And remember I said this is spontaneous. So you get a high enough concentration of viral genomes, you get a high enough concentration of viral proteins, they automatically assemble, and then the next step is release or exit. So how does the virus get out of the cell to find the next host? And that's what's also pretty cool. There are two main methods. There is lysis, which is basically bust open the cell, and there is budding, <coughs> excuse me, and this is for enveloped, so I should say this is for naked viruses, enveloped, where the virus assembles and then it wraps itself in the phospholipid bilayer. Um, this, I think, like is one of the most beautiful pictures in the world. This is a bacterial cell, you can kind of see the outline, being lysed, and all these little phages, look at those little guys, being released from the bacterial cell. So this is lysis in its most beautiful form. The virus, or basically the virus, yeah, the virus replicates to so such a high concentration that it just fills up the cell like a big water balloon and just poof, bursts open and all these thousands of virions are released into the environment or wherever this bacteria is to go find a new cell. Budding is pretty awesome too. So budding is where the virus is pushing out through the cell membrane in order to wrap itself in that envelope. So this is an example of HIV, and so you can see it. Okay, so this is false colored, so you can see it, but it's pushing through the envelope, pushing through, and all these little spikes are the viral proteins, and all this stuff inside is the capsid in the genome. And look at this virus just bud um, off of the cell. This is influenza, which is also an envelope virus. Look at all these viruses just like budding. And so what happens to the cell, as you can imagine, the cell's trying to keep its plasma membrane. The viruses are taking the plasma membrane and eventually the cell will die because it just runs out of membrane. It can't make membrane fast enough. Um, so budding is how enveloped viruses get out of the cell. Okay, so that takes you through the six steps of a virus replication cycle. I have trained myself very well to not say the virus life cycle, but if you Google virus life cycle, you will get the same steps. Lastly, I wanna talk just about some terms you might see with um, types of infections. So the type of infection a virus causes is a combination between the type of virus the health of the host, so the immune system, and did the virus encounter the right types of cells? Did it hit its tropism? Because we have plant viruses in our gut all the time from the vegetables we eat. They don't do anything to us because we don't have the right types of cells for them. So you can get a virus into the wrong place in your body and it doesn't do anything because 
it doesn't have the right cells to infect. So let's say a virus can find the right kinds of cells to infect. We're going to talk about all these different ones. So an acute is a short-term infection. I can't believe this. Okay, this is what most of us get. We get a cold. We're clogged up. It's not bacterial. We can't take antibiotics. We have to wait it out. It's acute affection. You get lots of virus produced. It causes some inflammation. It might kill some cells. You get over it. What's happening at the cellular level is called the cytopathic effects, also called CPE. And that means what is the virus doing to your cells? So this is tissue culture. So here's healthy cells. These are virus infected cells. So you can see they kind of round up. They're not happy. They're not laying flat. They're not connecting with each other. In the lab, this is how we look for a virus infection because obviously the cell culture is not going to sneeze and run a fever and show us those immunology signs. So we look for cytopathic effects. What happens in your body is your immune system kicks in, kills the cells that are infected with virus, gets rid of the virus. You might have a fever, cough, you might have some of those symptoms of a cold, and that's really just your immune system kicking in to get rid of the virus. Many times you will have what we call an abortive infection. So you have some host factor missing. Okay. So if you take a deep breath right now, or better do that in class, next time you're in class, you're going to be hit with all kinds of bacteria and virus. And most of the time you don't get sick because there's some kind of host factor missing or your immune system kicks in. And what abortive means is for virus infections, little, oops, or no virus infection. Okay. So you're bombarded with everything all the time. A null infection, and honestly, we never talk about these, but they're technical terms for virology, so I want to give them to you. A null infection means no infection at all. The virus never hits, no, what do I want to say, appropriate. receptor. Okay, so a null infection stops right here. An abortive infection stops somewhere. You don't produce progeny virus. Okay, so acute abortive null infections we get all the time. We clear them. We might feel crappy for a day or so. We're over it. Whoop. And that goes to show you what I was just showing you. Okay, we can also have latent infections. And latent infections are lifelong infections that flare up. Okay, so some examples are herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, VZV is the virus that causes chickenpox and later in life causes shingles and HIV. So what's happening is that you have this short-term infection and then the virus remains. But it's not always producing virus. Okay. So herpes is a great example of this. 
If you have cold sores on your mouth, lips, you have herpes. I will tell you right now, I have herpes. Okay, most people have herpes. And so what happens is every once in a while, usually once a semester, um, I will get a cold sore on my lips and it's the same place every time. I have three different places on my lips and I can feel it. I can feel it tingling and I'm like, crap, I'm gonna get a blister. I'm gonna put, um, I use lysine, I put uh, camphophenic, I put anything that I can to try to stop this virus. But what's happening is, okay, this is not a beautiful picture. What is happening, this is not a beautiful picture, is that this is a neuron. Okay, and these are all types of um, viruses in the herpes family, and they hang out. They hang out in your neuron. And then every once in a while, they decide to reactivate, right? Reactivation, and they go to your beautiful lips, and they cause this nasty cold sore, and your partner says, don't kiss me, and it's probably a good idea because you're very contagious. And then your immune system kicks in, and the cold sore is taken care of. Whoops. Your lips remain. Whoops. I should be smiley. <laughs> the virus goes back and hangs out. Back. Oh, that's what I was going to show you. Hangs out there. That is a typical latent infection. You get acute subclinical infection, immune system controls it, you're down. But you never totally clear the virus. And part of the reason is these viruses stay in what we call an episome, which is like a plasmid. So they don't integrate into your genome, but they, they replicate every time your cells divide. And if you know, neurons don't divide very often, so these viruses just hang out there um, nice and happy. And every once in a while, cause a cold sore, and then retreat. And cause a cold sore, the immune system comes up, but the virus is always there. Um, HIV is a little bit different because HIV actually integrates into the cell's chromosome. So once you are infected with HIV, you're infected for life because it becomes part of your genetic material. Now, you can definitely take um, medications that keep the level of virus very low, but you're infected for life, at least right now. So let me show you a nice example of VZV. I'm sorry, let me show you a nice example of a latent virus, ah, which is VZV. So in children, VZV causes chickenpox. Now, children these days get a vaccine to varicella, um, but what's super interesting is the chickenpox vaccine is a live virus. And a couple lectures from now, we're going to talk about vaccines. But that means they actually infect you with the chickenpox virus. It's a really good vaccine because it causes a strong immune reaction. But it also means that you have this virus forever. That when you're older, like me, can reactivate and cause zoster, which is shingles. So even if you were a kid that never got chicken pox because you had the chicken pox vaccine, you still have a live virus in your body that can reactivate when you're older and cause shingles. Well, guess what? Biopharma has made a uh, vaccine against shingles. We won't get into the um, ethics of giving someone a virus and then having them get a vaccine against it later, but 
you can kind of see how this works, right? It's a latent virus. Most people don't get shingles, but um, it can reactivate and cause shingles. And I've heard that shingles is very uncomfortable. It's like this itchy rash that breaks through your skin. Um, it's not something that you want to have. So unfortunately, I'm getting to the age where I probably have to get a shingles vaccine soon. And I do not like shots. But I love virology, so yeah. Okay. Another type of virus infection is called transforming. And that is where the virus can change the cell properties and make them cancerous. And really cancer is just uncontrolled cell division. So in transforming viruses, what happens is you have integration of viral DNA. Somehow a gene or two, not the whole genome, becomes part of your cellular DNA, and that tells the cell, go for it, divide. I don't care what the body says, divide, 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 divide. And we know this hallmark of cancer is something called a tumor. Unfortunately, if one of those cells breaks off, it's called a metastatic tumor, which means the cancer can move to other places in your body. So again, only some viruses do this. Um, human papillomavirus is a great example, but so is Epstein-Barr virus, which many of us have been exposed to. So is hepatitis B and hepatitis C. These are all cancer, potentially cancer-causing. Obviously, not always, you can get an abortive infection but you can also get that virus integrating part of its DNA and making your cells um, cancerous. So again, here are some examples of transforming viruses, um, HVV, HCV and HBV um, can cause uh, liver damage they now have treatments for HCV, but not for hepatitis um, B virus. Kaposi's, um, I always swear there was an R in that word, but um, sarcoma um, is very common with people with uh, HIV infections and to the end point of AIDS. Um, this virus can take over and make these cancerous like purple lesions on the skin. Um, here's your human papillomaviruses. And if you, if you see, it's just a couple genes from the virus that are called viral oncogenes. So they are cancer causing viral genes. And we now have a human papillomavirus um, vaccine that we give young people, hopefully before they're sexually active, to prevent um, cervical, anal, penile, um, vaginal cancers. So we're, we're working on combating these viruses. Um, not always successful, but viruses have lots of strategies to keep themselves in a host system. Okay, so additional topics that we're going to cover this semester, but it's silly to throw this all at you, is um, we're going to talk about transmission of viruses, so how they go from host to host. We're going to talk about reservoirs, whoops, and zoonosis. Most of this comes with our Ebola. We're going to talk about vaccines 
and kind of the lack of antivirals when we talk about um, influenza. And like I said, as you guys research your um, specific viruses for your final um, paper or presentation, I want you to think about all these different um, replication cycle and again as we talk about transmission and vaccines and antivirals and what's the genome and what's its replication strategy and what's its tropism, what's its host range. Um, I taught this class a couple years ago and I went through all of this information in the first few weeks and I realized it just totally overloaded the students. So instead of giving you all the replication strategies and um, all, all, all these different components of um, 